Welcome, friend, to the dark side of the autistic community. Too many people, regardless of their neurotype, and I probably don't need to be saying this, but dating doesn't really feel worth it anymore. To some, it feels like a genuine danger to our emotional and physical health. To the majority, it's quite confusing, but to autistic people, it's not only like a huge amount of potential change coming into our life, but it's akin to walking into a maze, a big, big old maze, blind. And that's what it can feel like sometimes. So today we are going to be looking at five big mistakes that specifically autistic people, possibly yourself, may be making in the pursuit of a happy relationship. Hopefully I can make the first part of this maze a little less confusing and hard to navigate. Number one, just focusing on romance, intimacy, whatever you're looking for, and avoiding or reducing social communication that you would have with friends, family, acquaintances, work colleagues, anyone really. Let's face it, a lot of autistic people, including myself, have a lot less energy to spend socialising with other human beings. When you set your sights on finding a partner, you may focus intensely on dating, swiping on all of the apps, going out on dates every weekend, at any time that you have free, even leaving your calendar open for potential dates, which more frequently than not will cancel you. The potential issues with passing off your time that you would be spending with friends and family to be pursuing a romantic partner is manifold. It's, it's pretty large. You will likely get out of the habit of communicating, making any future meetings that you may have with both friends and family and people of that nature, possibly even your job, but also romance. Awkward, difficult, perhaps the conversation might not flow as usual because talking to people, communicating, you know, there's lots of different aspects to it. There's communication and behavior, but generally it's something that you need to practice daily that you need to do on a regular basis if you want to stay comfortable doing that thing. And I'm not saying go out and mask and enjoy it if you have to. And, you know, obviously use personal discretion, but generally having time with people that you feel comfortable allows you to sort of flex that communication muscle a lot easier if you are just meeting up with somebody that you've never met on a dating app and trying to have a conversation. It's definitely going to give you a bad impression to, to yourself of your own communication skills. All of your beg, all of your begs, <laughs> please sir, give me some more dates. <laughs> all of your eggs will be in the dating basket. Making each cancellation and dating failure a lot more hard hitting to both your mental health and your self esteem. Cancelling social events, not being proactive with friends, <laughs> and not maintaining communication to the level that you usually would may lead to a deterioration of your friendships and your network, your family, your work colleagues. Perhaps those relationships will start to fizzle, especially if the other person feels as if you are not thinking of them anymore, feels as if you don't want to talk to them anymore. It could genuinely be a thing if you have such a small, small social battery and you spend it all meeting new people, talking to new people, texting new people. You may not have as much time for your friends. Not having friends and not having a network is a pretty large deficit to someone's life. They're quite important. We are human beings. We may have a lower social battery, but genuinely it does have a large impact on our mental health. And I'd say put your effort into building it first if you don't currently have a network of people that you can rely on. I'm not just talking about work. I know that's used. Go to network with some people. <laughs> Would you like to come to my work event? You can network with Jeff from accounting. <laughs> Put your effort into building it first, if you don't have it. It's important. And I'm going to go on to why it's important in a later point. You see, there isn't really much difference between socializing with mates and socializing with a potential date. Other than perhaps conversations and actions around intimacy and romance, I assure you, I'm 
pretty goddamn sure you know what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to elaborate for my own mental sanity. Sometimes we put dates in a different box to other people. Kind of like we put everything that they say into sort of an amplifier. Everything feels more, every small action feels more because, you know, there's a potential that you might not get another chance with this person. This is the dating world. This is romance. And especially these days, a lot of people have a lot of different options for some people. So we put them in a different box, the romance and love box. We don't give that to friends. <laughs> well, I mean, some people do. Anyway, what I'm rambling. I'm I'm going all over the place and falling apart. I know that in my experience, the best results that I've had in dating is if I treat the other person like a friend, in a sense. Obviously, you add in the flirting, the sort of jokes, maybe a couple of little tiny, acceptable, non-offensive jokes. <laughs> Negs, is that what that POAs call it? Pick up artists. You gotta neg the girl. You gotta let, let her know that you're a douche. That's how you do it. So those best experiences I've had in dating is just, you know, me treating them like another human being, being myself, asking questions, enjoying my time. Yes, very strange thing to do. Enjoy going out was something you don't know. I mean, it's a little bit more stressful than just like going out with friends and enjoying it, but try and enjoy what you're doing. If you're playing mini golf, you know, enjoy that, you know, smack it into like the old um, granny's window, you know, pee them off and run away, sort of giggling into the air. <laughs> Number two, not of that list of the points, the mistakes that we are talking about today. People often say that looks do not matter. It's what's inside that counts. It's an organ that frequently pumps blood around your body. And if it stops, you die. As an autistic person, like many life lessons that parents and teachers and people have told me, or just generally I've seen in the media or in films, I found out slowly the truth. And that statement, sort of looks don't matter, it's about what's inside, is wrong. Well, it's, it's a half lie. Looks do matter, and what matters is also what is inside. Your feelings, your personality, the depths of your character. Important. Love, personality, values is obviously like highly, highly important in relationships, and you've got to have a good sort of compatible personality, you know, good moral character. But whether you like the idea or not, looks do play a massive role in getting your foot in the door. A lot of people, they won't consider someone for romance sort of straight off the bat, especially if you're on a dating app, if they don't find you as attractive as they would want you to be. Now, I'm not going to go all black, red pill. I don't don't know which pill it would be on you because I think there is a lot of aspects of familiarity and attraction to someone's personality that really play a large role in someone sort of finding you attractive over the long term. But I think it's often forgot about and a lot of people choose to ignore it. Usually what would happen in the old days of dating is you would like join a social club, go to work social club these days. Does TikTok count as a social group? <laughs> I suppose it does. It's a really large group of people who say mean things about my autism. <laughs> the mainstream aspects of attractiveness, and I do put mainstream in front of it because you know it's a very philosophical comple com complex context. concept. Those mainstream aspects of attractiveness detailed by YouTube channels like Cues, I think it's Quoves, I'll put a link down it into the description, holds a lot of power in inviting positive personality judgments. Looks, looks do, indeed. The halo effect represents this fact quite well, showing better life outcomes on all fronts for those who score highly in this mainstream sort of characterization of attractiveness. It's really a big thing, but it's often forgot about and many people choose to ignore it. Why? 
I think it's important to say that, of course, of course, I'm not this heartless sort of, you know, thinking that everybody thinks the same is attracted to the same thing. I'm not. Looks do vary in importance from person to person. Some people really need very, very stereotypically attractive people. Probably a better word than mainstream. And sometimes people have a particular type of person. Maybe it's the way they dress, what they do, their voice, you know, large large amount of things. If they have a lot of those things, perhaps it doesn't really matter as much how, you know, if they're 10 out of 10 gorgeous, handsome man. It's ways how attractive someone can, can be to you. But there is a pretty solid science of attraction. Of looks, it's been like mathematically, scientifically studied. You know, if babies look at an attractive face, they tend to oogle it a little bit more. They make more contact looking at that face than perhaps someone who is stereotypically less attractive. Look, I could go on about like the evidence behind it, but whether people say it out loud or not, stereotypical beauty is a thing. It just is. Doesn't mean everybody thinks the same, they don't have their own type, all of that stuff. But it but it is. You know, I can see a male model. I'm I'm a heterosexual, if you didn't know. I can see a male model and think, hmm, that's that's an attractive guy. You know, it's not for me. I like I like the more feminine people. But it's not for me, it's not for me, but he's attractive. I can I can tell. It's it's apparent to me. Doesn't really matter one way or the other. They display a lot of symmetrical, nice sort of uniform features. There is a heavy genetic factor that plays into people's looks. But from my own research, here are some of the top tips which can apply to both men and women. Basically, I'm going to give you an overview of kind of the base level things that would probably give you the most results for what you're doing. Because, I mean, people out there have like seven step beauty programs, skincare programs. They have like a serum and they have like a cleanser and they double cleanse and they have a moisturizer and a, a some sauce that they snail muse in. <laughs> so people do a lot of stuff, but generally using a cleanser twice a day, preferably spaced out from each other, probably a good thing. And if you're using a moisturizer, which you probably should, you would want to look for one that has a significant amount of SPF protection if you're applying it in the morning and you're going outside, which I hope that you're doing today. Finding something that works for you is a good shout, but generally if you don't really care about the ins and outs of sort of different beauty products and skincare and all that, generally just look for the basic brands, the ones that do the stuff the trusted brands that do the stuff on the tin. I'm not going to go for a particular brand because, I mean, the cosmetics industry, from what I know from watching YouTube videos on it, is very heavily pushed by marketing, by like giving it to people who practice beauty, just, to, you know, just have little canisters on the side, just so that they know that the beautician people are using this and this is probably a trusted one, the one that they want to do. And then like the beauty, the, the company sort of gives it to the, to the store, but you as the beautician person, you try it and you're like, Hey, it's pretty good. You know, you get it. It's, it's like good skincare. And so you recommend it to people, little, little insider to the cosmetics industry. I'm watching you, not you, the person behind you. I don't probably need to say brush your teeth because I feel like I mean, that's just like the basic thing that people talk about, one of them. But when you are brushing your teeth, if you want to, try using, preferably wash the toothbrush first, try using the toothbrush to sort of lightly exfoliate your lips. If you find that you've got quite cracked sort of dry lips, maybe just give them a bit of exfoliation, you know? Don't rub the toothpaste into it, just water. Just a little bit and don't rub them so raw and red to the point where it looks like you have made out with a chainsaw. That's that's not a good that's not a good place to go. Of course, whitening strips can be helpful. Just be careful you've got sensitive teeth, do your research. But also tongue scrapers. 
Ugh. They're horrible. They're gross. You gotta put them right at the back of your mouth. Get it right down to the back of your throat. It's like a like a metal thing. It's like a little U shape, like a horseshoe. You can scrape all the gunk off your tongue. Generally, that's quite good for your oral hygiene if you do it regularly for like a week and then now and again. It also does wonders for bad breath if you struggle with that. Could be a thing to try. Who knows? I'm not you. You know. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're a nosmic. That would be unfortunate. Lastly, I'm not going to tell you, but I am going to tell you in the same vein. Showering is important. Yes, I know. It's our natural smell. It's what we're supposed to smell like. Well, most people don't like it. So make sure you shower often. At least once every two days, preferably once every day. Grooming. It may be a great idea to visit a hairstylist. Yes, not a hairdresser, a hairstylist. To trial out some looks and find a haircut that suits you the best. Because everyone's different. Stuff works for other people, some people got curly hair, some have got straight hair, some have got thick hair, luscious locks, some people have got thin hair. Some people have no hair at all. So if you're one of those people, um, continue to like a minute or two. <laughs> Just skip it. Personally, I get my hair cut at least once a month. Well, usually, because currently I am trying out different styles to see which one I like the most. So I'm growing out, growing it out a little bit longer gonna go for the Jon Snow look. You know what I mean? Maybe. I don't know. For men, make sure to opt for facial hair that you've researched, meaning you know how to maintain it. You can maintain it. You know, it doesn't eat up into your battery enough. It's in your routine. And also find a shape to that facial hair. You know, make sure that you do it properly. A lot of people don't do it properly because they don't research everything on this earth, like whenever they just don't know some intricate detail like I do. I mean, you, you're probably autistic if you're watching this video, so I imagine that you are, and you'll have fun researching everything that I've talked about. If you want to have that smooth, silky body, maybe get rid of that underarm hair so you have to rely less on antiperspirant, like myself, doing so with a razor, not fun. Real prickly. Sensory hell. It's awful. <laughs> Don't do that. Make sure that you get a razor. A dedicated body trimmer. Something that preferably is, is one shape. So it's sort of shaped like that. It's got a little... I'll probably put a picture up somewhere. Um, get one of those. Because it makes just the whole process of shaving much, much easier. Slick. You know, do it in one kind of battery charge. Kind of slick. That's That's considerable for me. <laughs> I've got a lot of hair. I am a caveman. I was a caveman in a past life. I mean, in my experience, I have very thick body hair. I've got a lot of it. And even just on the lowest setting for that trimmer, it's it's very tolerable. Perhaps maybe not on the buttocks area, if anything, but generally it was quite tolerable. So highly recommend getting a dedicated body trimmer. Number three, I've got to get a lot of dislikes for this, <laughs> for this one. Exercise and healthy eating. I think it's worth highlighting that I don't promote the shaming of fat bodies, people who are overweight. But generally, being a healthy weight does a lot for your overall health, your mobility. It helps highlight your facial bones, the underlying facial structure, and gives you generally a leaner and generally a more attractive physique, frame, whatever you want to call it. To the majority of people, of course. You don't need to be a single digit body fat, dry out of your minds, like bodybuilders at competitions all the time, or even just like gym people. You know, any anything from about, I'd say probably 12, maybe 10 for some people to 20% body fat is maintainable. Even if you do like to eat a lot like myself, I can still maintain around about 20% body fat. For women, it tends to be a little bit higher because a lot of that fat tends to be necessary for women. And so maybe 21 to 28% might be a better benchmark. Doesn't, it sounds like a lot. It's it's not really that much. Believe me. <laughs> I think stage, stage, ready, stage ready female bodybuilders, they're like 
16, 18% body fat, something like that. They look super lean. Not as lean as the guys, but it doesn't, definitely doesn't look like that much. Maybe it's all in the booty. Make sure to hydrate yourself frequently. Opt for high protein snack alternatives. Preferably stay away from the processed stuff. I mean, if you're having something that's healthy and processed, uh, I'm sure it's better than having something that is not healthy and processed. But make your own discretion. I don't eat like a saint, like a dedicated bodybuilder all the time. Generally, I just eyeball it and, you know, intuitive eat. But then again, I used to be an athlete, so don't track. You, you don't have to do that. Just try and eat good whole food. Make sure you're drinking a lot of water. And generally, sort of walk about life with a mild feeling of hunger. If you can do that, you're eating whole foods, you're not eating lots of processed stuff with high calories and low density. Um, you want to you wanna go for stuff which is whole, and then you can sort of gauge it based on your hunger levels. Just, just in my experience. I'd highly, highly recommend, not biased at all, to try out the gym. Ugh. Or sport, or anything that you want to do. Walking, good, great. It's it's a good form of sort of steady state cardio. It's not going to really push up your lung capacity very much though. So I highly recommend some kind of uh, some kind of intense activity. It doesn't need to be like literally intense. Just the name of it is intense. So you, you know you push yourself harder than than walking and sort of lightly jogging or something like that. I can't lightly jog. <laughs> I can kick things. I can punch things. I can pow. I can... Ooh. You know, you can't jog. You know, it's the old knees. If you want to ballpark on like how much to do, uh, generally doing like a little bit of cardio every day is good. You don't need to go crazy with it. Um, you could go crazy with it for like three days a week and then just do nothing for the rest if you if you really wanted to. Um, but that generally is a good way to go about it. In terms of weight training, which is both good for sort of, you know, maintaining muscle mass, you know, increasing strength. Uh, people use the term tone quite a lot for women. No such thing as toning, there's just losing fat and gaining muscle, which is generally what people characterize as toning. Maybe there is a use for it, I guess. But it, you are building muscle, you know. I'd recommend at least twice a week. You train your upper and lower body muscles. You can do all sorts of splits. I'm not going to go into a bodybuilding video today, but if you want to, and you know you want to try something new, get into a sport. Try badminton, go tennis, do some bowls. You know, go go for golf. Maybe jog between between each of your swings. You do not need to look like a bodybuilder. Like old Tom. I mean, I don't look like a pro bodybuilder, but I look like I've dabbled, I'd say. Um, generally, like, just a mild amount of muscle. Having an athletic sort of slim frame is a lot more appealing to most people than a bulky bodybuilder like myself. Um, but do as you wish. It's your body. You know, these are just tips. If, if you want to follow them, you'd have to follow this one. <laughs> or the next one. Or any of this, really. Unless I force you to. Fashion! Yes, we're going on to the runway. Finding some clothes that are well fitted. Layered well. You know, good colour combinations. Simplistic. Jeans and a black t-shirt, you know. You don't always have to buy these best-selling, sort of highly, highly looked at top brands. Like fancy labels on it to to look like you know how to dress yourself. If you do not want to, if you have a style that you already have, or if there is a certain sense of dress that you want to try, try following people with a similar frame, sort of height as, as well, preferably, um, and a similar look to you, and, and the look that you want to go for, and copy them. Just do it. It's okay. They won't mind <laughs> unless you tag them and you say you are that person and you get multiple amounts of facial reconstruction to look exactly like them. I think they would be bothered then. I mean, these days we've got AI, so you could probably do that without completely altering your life. 
yeah, there's there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing wrong with emulating it, but try not to go too over the top with it too quickly. Make small baby steps, you know, get the essentials, try out some stuff if you like it, get a few accessories, whatever you like, even get your face stabbed, like myself. Don't know if you can see it. Get it stabbed. We like the stabs. Not not the actual stabbing, just the after product of the stabbing. I'm going to move on. Lastly, the aesthetics. What I mean is makeup. I just named it something else to lure you in, lure new masculine men in. You know, the men, men don't wear makeup, all that kind of stuff. I am not a fan of full face contouring facial reconstruction type makeup, but there are a few great quick tools that you can try if you feel comfortable enough in your masculinity, and if you feel comfortable enough with putting um, unknown substances on your face. Concealer can be great for reducing the appearance of dark circles under your eyes. Also great if you have acne, or perhaps some type of razor burn. I don't know if it's, that, it's the best thing to do to put it on the razor burn, but definitely reduces the the appearance of it, if that's what you're going for. Do, do your own research. Do your own research. Despite the feeling of burning lava entering your mouth, lip plumpers, basically capsaicin, some kind of chemical that burns your lip, makes it all red and plump, um, could be an option if you really want to go for it. You could do that after exfoliating your lips with a toothbrush. It's quite, quite, um, Low effort thing, if you feel like your lips could do with a bit more. You know, men look good with nice lips. Women look good with nice lips. Eyelash curlers. Yes, very underrated. Very much harder to do than you think it would be. It works for everybody. No one will notice. Guys, just curl your eyelashes. Makes your lashes look more luscious. Girls like, girls like the lashes, you know. And if you want to be real spicy, get yourself a clear mascara. You know, just bit of, bit just think of it as a bit of water just to like solidify the, the effect of your um eyelash curling. You don't have to do it. If you think it's unmasculine, you know, don't do it. Keep saying that. I just know what guys are like, you know. <laughs> they hear makeup, you know. Makeup? I can't be doing that. That means that I am a female. A female. A woman. I can't have that. I've got to be masculine men. I don't care. That's how masculine I am. Tinted moisturizers can help even your skin tone if you want to do it. I have tried it before. I don't particularly like it, so I don't do it anymore. And chewing gum can help strengthen your jawline a little, jawline, amongst other benefits. Just don't go too hard or you will end up with a, was it, tempo, temporal mandibular in junction injury, TMJ, kind of this issue with your jaw, and you don't want that. Just take care of yourself with simple and long-term tested things, no gimmicks, none of that stuff, just generally stuff that makes you look more appealing to people. Um, most people, m maybe mainstream people. <laughs> Gotta keep, keep putting that caveat in there. It can do a lot for both increasing your attractiveness, mainstream-wise, your health, and your self-confidence, of course. If you want to make these changes, make your way down the list with these one to three things at a time. You don't want to go too many at too much point because you're not going to know how to do it. It's not in your muscle memory. It's going to take ages every day and you're just going to hate it. So just do it slowly. Pick the things that you want to target and do them if you want to. Or just do none of them and wait for the next slide, the next part. Number three, solely using dating apps. Yes, I see you. I see you out there, that person who has locked on that I have seen them. You, know, It's an enticing idea that you can swipe through in the privacy of your own home, um, whether you're on the bus, you know, whether you're in bed, whether you're taking a dump, 
you can swipe through <laughs> just imagining like two people who have like matched with each other on tinder while they're both taking a dump and they're like speaking very romantically and sort of nicely it's a beautiful thought you can swipe through the pictures and you can find someone that you find attractive and someone that finds you attractive and perhaps if they're you know invested in finding something like long term they'll make the effort to read your profile you go out on a date perhaps you progress things in the relationship that would be great however it is not as simple as that and in fact it's pretty damn complicated <laughs> and fairly demoralizing it's a fairly demoralizing experience for many people i know i'm looking particularly at one side and i do realize that people are they thems and all of that and some people don't like the gender binary but for a lot of dudes masculine presenting people there we go dating apps um are not good for us unless you are extremely model-esque attractive you will find it very very difficult uh, to have matches with people to find people to talk to or talk to you back to go out on dates with people and for both men and women and everyone in, in between everybody it can be difficult to assess the intentions of other people accurately if you manage to secure a date there's no telling how much of an actual connection texting somebody writing a letter to someone digitally transfers to real life conversation you know you can help that by having a little video call maybe an audio call whatever your preference is um, but generally that's the way that it goes for most people for most and i am being serious here dating apps can make us very resentful and foster a lot of hatred for the gender or the sex of the person that we're interested in those with pure true intentions tend to leave the apps just forget about them and just leave them in the dust or become corrupted by others who take advantage of them thinking that this is just the way that dating goes and so the cycle continues feeding a cycle of treating other people as disposable assets i'm not saying this is everybody um you can find genuinely lovely great people in on online dating apps you can it's true but it's pretty hard it's kind of like playing a game of roulette every time that you meet a person in person and you're hoping for the green you're hoping for the zero you know perhaps if you are more attractive if you have a better profile if you have something like status and all sorts of different things uh there may be more likelihood that you'll get more spins but you still got to make that spin you got to make those odds and i don't know what those odds are but there's only one green <laughs> perhaps there's there's some that are like partially green you know maybe the green from the zero sort of expands around just a little bit just a tiny bit you know you can never know if you found the true green and that's another problem with dating apps it is likely that the type of person that you are looking for is in short supply on the apps most autis autistic people that i meet are introverts after all not all of us i say i'm pretty in the middle when it comes to version <laughs> but to a lot of people we are you know um it's hard to go out and meet somebody that you've never met up before especially in a place that you don't know especially if you're traveling and you've got to make it to the train on a certain time if you're going out for like drinks or, or food or something it can be quite a stressful situation for a lot of people and you know due to the the experiences that autistic people can have with others in life like related to bullying and sa and lots lots of all the horrible different things um it can just like it's just a big risk you know for, for potentially a lot of people and um sort of leave a bad taste in your mouth sometimes the alternative because you know you're not here to hear me rant about what dating can be like for people um join a club pick up a sport go to a sporting club something of that nature join a social group pick up just a hobby that you like and talk about it with people that you be it'll make conversation a lot 
more easy if you are joining a club or a sports team, something of that nature. It builds a lot of fami familiarity. So both for our friends and potential partners, familiarity is, is quite a big thing. A lot of people, <laughs> like a tremendous amount of people will say, I'm shy until you get to know me. It's like, okay. <laughs> like, isn't everybody like just a little bit? Like, go to a place that feels comfortable and allows you to make friends at the same time. But, oh dear, perhaps all of your hobbies do not have a social element or a social group or a gathering of people that you can go and talk to. Perhaps you like video games. Well, why haven't you considered going to an event or a social group which is sort of close to what you might like, but also something that may attract the type of person that might be your type, that's good for you. Don't abuse this. <laughs> I know a lot of you, you you know, you just suddenly, suddenly, it's, you know, you guys out there, or, you know, lesbians, you may find... Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Compose yourself, Tom. You men out there, I know what you're doing, you just... Out of nowhere, just have a real appreciation and love for yoga. Just for no reason. Yeah, you want to go to a club? Just just, just for the yoga. You know? Just for the yoga. If you like video games, just give a popular sort of thing that people like to do. Why not try a board game club? A card game club? You may enjoy the gym, so why not try a sport or a club? You know, for me... I love exercising, it's great. Um, I'm around people, I don't really get many opportunities to sort of socialise and work with people one on one, but Muay Thai, doing my, my fighting, my pew pew, you know, I'm a dangerous man. That can, be, that can be a good sort of place for me to make conversation with people because I know that they want to talk to me because, you know, well, I mean, they may not want to, but you know what I mean. We've got some, some common place. We're having fun, we're doing something else. We don't need to give all of our attention and put it on to one person. We can do other stuff. We can punch things and create things in a Muay Thai club. That's the place to do it, you know? Uh, that's a good thing for us if you just don't really have a, a, a strong social battery and you don't particularly like making conversation with strangers. Uh, have something else to do. They won't blame you for focusing more on your sport unless they really like you. And then you can be like, hey, haha. <laughs> Friends, maybe, romantic partner. So it's really not the best idea to put all your hopes in an application owned by a company who has a vested interest in making you feel bad about yourself or that there is a very limited amount of people who are going to be compatible with you for like a relationship, for a dating venture. It's just what you get when you put your faith into a goddamn app. <laughs> However, the other options are a door to finding community, to friends, to maintaining, even improving your social skills, not masking, it's a different thing, and perhaps even learning a new skill in the process. If you are enjoying this, just have to say it, unsponsored video, please make sure to like, Subscribe and consider becoming a member for as little as 99p to support your boy. I have a lot of different membership tiers. I put it as low as I possibly could. And any support that you can give me in my YouTube journey be massively appreciated. Numero four. I always do this wrong. Why do I put down my pinky finger? Why can't I just do that like a normal person? I don't know. This, this is like, this is the five... The five finger, the five form, makes sense to me. I go, I suppose I go that way, don't I? You know, forget it. Going like that to say one is weird. I think that's why. Hmm. Assuming autistic and neurotypical people will reciprocate and appreciate directness or even accommodate you to a certain degree. People like to talk, specifically like psychologists and people of that nature, they talk a lot about communication and directness, saying, oh, this is amazing. 
I mean, don't you think it's funny that generally we are picked out, lambasted for having qualities that professionals try to instill in everyday people to have better communication skills? Weird. It comes naturally to us. And yet we have a social disorder. Weird that. The thing is, people will say what they like, and they often don't know what they like until they find somebody who is genuinely honest and direct, until they meet that person that has those qualities, even if they do. Even if they like the directness and the honesty, doesn't mean that they'll appreciate it. When you're saying something that they do not like, that they, they, they don't want, they don't appreciate that. They think that the only reason why you're saying this is because it's such a big thing, but it's not. It's it's something that, <laughs> it's just a, a negative quality that, you know, if you explain to them, say, oh, what's, what's your red flags? And you answer genuinely and say like, oh, I have an avoidant personality. Um, people are not going to really like that too much. The problem also is, is that they don't tend to reciprocate it. So they might want those qualities, but they don't reciprocate in the same way. Here's the kicker. Both autistic and neurotypical people can and will be indirect. I know we tend to have a bit of a preference for it, a predilection for it, if you will. But it doesn't stop people playing games. It doesn't stop people lying. And it doesn't stop people... Have not having the courage to speak directly about something, particularly if it is a negative thing or something that they deem is, is might be something that you don't want to hear. You know, self advocacy is difficult as well, especially when you are like me. You advocate for your direct communication. It's not always so black and white in application. You know. Self-advocacy is great, but you do need to have a degree of patience just with relationships in general, but specifically with indirect communication. You do not have to use it if you don't want to. I'd highly recommend you don't because we tend to like the direct stuff a lot more. It makes life simpler and easier for everybody. But learning to understand it can be very, very important, especially in initial stages. And if that person doesn't know that you're autistic and you have differences. They may interpret it as being like rude or abrupt or something like that. Generally, people who like direct communication are probably like you, but it's up to your discretion of, of whether you want to learn how people communicate indirectly and give people a little bit of leeway, you know, as if we don't give people leeway enough. <laughs> Sultistic people. Assessing actions as being more important than words is painful. It sucks. I hate it. We often put a lot of trust in words, put a lot of trust in honesty as autistic people because we think that other people will do the same. But many others definitely do not. When you put so much emphasis, so much weight and trust in the exact words that people are communicating to you, you don't often see the truth. Or at least if they are speaking indirectly, um... You may not see the truth, or, or maybe to a certain degree, you know, if you, if you have communicated with a neurotypical species, <laughs> you're dating a neurotypical, you force yourself to be blind to it because you just would prefer the reality that people speak that way. You just, you just got to remember that people don't always play by those rules and, you know, you got to keep yourself safe. Take, take into account their actions. Take into account the indirect stuff if you can spot it, you can see it. Or ask them about it, if you don't feel comfortable. Being honest and direct to the point, good leader qualities. You know, it's an admirable thing. It's a great thing. It's an amazing quality for a person to have. It's one of the qualities that I look for in everyone that I like to associate myself with. It just makes life easier, more comfortable and simple. But we must place boundaries. Not everybody plays by those rules. Numero five, we are there. Make sure to like and subscribe. Not allowing space for them to reciprocate. When we are single, when we are alone for a long period of time, it can seem like 
every potential connection, every little spark, little little tickle of tickle of electricity is like a cool cold glass of ice water with like a little slice of lemon on the side, little tiny little umbrella, little glass straw that swivels around. And in that glass is the most delicious cold water you could ever hope for. And you're in a desert. That's what it can feel like. It can just feel completely overwhelming to the point you question everything about yourself, about conversations that you have, about their intentions, about their feelings. You just, it's just so much. Like you, you just put, you're hanging on every word. You are, it's sort of the weight of it all is just pushing you down. You know, it's a hard thing. Even with those who have a strong sense of self-worth, may crumble by this. They may find themselves grasping, grasping for another, another sip of that delicious water. Loneliness and poor experience with other people in life can lead to a strong sense of longing when we find someone that we admire, that gives us warmth, that gives us hope for romance, gives us hope for love. You know, it's a, it's a natural human thing. It doesn't matter who you are. If you don't generally find people that, you know, you have that spark with, and it's the one day you do, um, it can feel like a like a scarce resource in, in a sense. That kind of idea of scarcity. We may make a lot of effort. We may ask to call. We may text them all the time. We may invite them to hang out, anxiously awaiting their text messages, and potentially go through large waves of euphoria and sadness based on small things like the amount of time that it takes for someone to message you back or the way that they said something, or, you know, what you think they were trying to say, just spiritually, you know. We're trying to reel them in, and it's not just for friends, it's for anybody. It's for someone that you admire, someone that you want to work with, someone who you do want to be buddies with, gym buddies, maybe. Or romantic relationships, of course. Even parents. I'm sorry if that's the case for you. The issue is, we aren't giving the person space we're showing them that we're really interested in them. Sometimes it can be a lot for people. Might not seem like a lot for you because you don't do it often, but it might be a lot to them. If you don't give them space to, I'm not going to say pursue, because I don't like framing it as like a game of cat and mouse and all that, but if you don't give them space to show you in some form that they like you and want to hang out with you and want to text you and things of that nature, you, you're never really going to know. You, you're not going to know where you're t when you start, where you stand until, you know, you just receive so many sort of mini rejections that you just fall apart and question everything that they've told you and their life. And I was going to get married to her mother. She was the one. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, it does not need to be a flat 50-50 thing, you know? It doesn't need to be, oh, you contacted them once this time, and then they have to contact you once the, the next time. And then if they contact you twice in a row, then you've got to contact them two times in a row, or that kind of thing. You, you don't really want to be doing that. But ideally, you want to assess if that person is interested in you. And it's good to give people space because it creates some sense of mystery, some sense of distance, so they can tell if they are missing you or not. They may not know. You may be there all the time. It really depends on the situation and the person as well. People tend to ramp up communication from my experience and the amount of times that they invite you to things when they become more familiar with you. Another callback. But in the same vein, everybody has their own unique social battery. They vary in how busy their life is, how stressful their life is, have different approaches to dating, or may just not be as much interested in you as you are in them. Yet. Yet is the one. And you might, you might be one of those people who are like, well, if they're not immediately infatuated with me, or immediately interested in me as much as I am every single time, we're not, we're not giving them my time, you know? It's a slow thing for a lot of people. Some people it's not. Some people it's like, you're hot. Be my girlfriend. Of course I've never done that. <laughs> really not the best thing to do. Just saying, from 
not personal experience. So examples. Let's give me for an example. I have a busy life most of the time. I have a much lower need for consistent communication. I like to call friends now and again and check in infrequently, infrequently to see how they are. I don't enjoy texting someone every day. And that's a big one for a lot of people. If you've ever tried to assert that boundary, some people will take this as a sign of disinterest. It just doesn't kind of match with how they have experienced dating in the past. And so they think that you're not interested in them, which maybe you are. So, so basically I can be very interested in somebody, but not give them that impression because of so some sense of communicational incompatibility. In another example, let's give another one, not just all about me, it's all about Tom today, isn't it? Someone may spend their entire life texting friends, socializing. Their favorite thing to do during work is to talk. And when they finish and go for break, they talk and they come back and they talk. <laughs> and then they, they go home and they call a friend on the bus, and they talk, and they get home, and they see their partner, or they go out on, on a night out or something, and of course they talk. Maybe not in a nightclub, but, you know, we've got a word for that, it's called out out. Learn it. Know the name. Due to their interest levels, despite all of this, they may not deem you worthy enough to give you their time. They may play games with you, you may need that time to build that interest in the first place. They could be using you for company. They may just like that you like them. A lot of people do. They may be deciding between multiple people. Or they may be manipulating you. Look, I don't want to go all doom and gloom and like fill your head with all these anxieties because this is not the point of why I'm saying this. There are only two variables that you need to look for. Keep it simple. Are they showing genuine interest? And are they either asking to see you at some point? Or do they accept your invitation? If they accept your invitation, do they actually come see you? Maybe at first one, two times, you can be like, eh, it seems unlikely, but you know, we haven't seen each, seen each other before. Maybe it's the first date. Third time, hmm. I mean, it's up to you. You just, you know, you got to, <laughs> Play it by what, how you feel comfortable to a certain degree. Really, it's a um, a complicated process, <laughs> but adjusting your expectations is very important, and giving time for people to reciprocate and show you that they're interested in you, so you don't waste your time. Um, it's great, and and making the effort, I think, also is it is a good sign that someone's you know wanting to pursue something, even if it's not. Just like it doesn't eventually turn out to be you. It could just be they're just generally looking to get tied down in a relationship. A little little chain attached between the two of you of, you know, lust, love. What other words are they? Anger? Irritability, maybe. At certain points, you know, of course. In conclusion, let me just... Scroll my mouse down. <clears throat> Dating is complex and often long if you're trying to find the right fit for you. Make sure to some degree be realistic. Give people a chance if they take a few of your boxes. They may turn out to be like, like it just feels enough. You know, you just don't care. You just like them. May be the case. Do not have a laundry list. I mean, have a laundry list if you want of things that you want. Um, but you don't need to get someone who just fits like 30 different points. You know, at that point, <laughs> if you pick really outrageous sort of rare characteristics in, in someone that you're going to date, it, it's a fantasy to, to a certain degree. It's, it's not really going to happen, but it can give you, it can set some certain degree, some certain degree, give you an idea of what you're looking for. And potentially what you're not looking for. If you want to make a list of that too. I'm making loads of lists here, of course. And look, it is important to remember that general advice of any kind, it is what it, what it is, is, is general advice. 
Do not underestimate the importance of nuance in individual circumstances with individual people. Applying general rules or advice of any kind without consideration for the complexities and differences in each situation is a very silly thing to do. Perhaps if someone has been showing a lot of interest in you um, over the weekend and you've been texting a lot and you've been calling a lot and all that kind of thing, perhaps you've even gone out together and had a great time. Um, and they haven't co called you or texted you back in like two, three days, you know, you don't have to have a rule that says, you know, someone doesn't talk to me for three days, but not for me kind of thing. Those kind of rules. You've got to take each situation for each situation. And sadly, it's not like a black and white thing. I think to some degree, like don't delude yourself, put your personal safety first whether that's physical or emotional, it needs to be in top priority, especially if you are using online dating. These principles, these pieces of advice have been incredibly helpful learning lessons for myself. They've helped me enormously, not just in romantic relationships, but in friendships and dating, family life even. So I'd love to know what your experiences are and thoughts are down in the comments. The best way to push me up in the algo is to tell YouTube you enjoy my videos by watching more. I'd highly recommend one of these videos if you have the time. If not, I will see you later.